Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Really happy to be here. Um, we're going to spend some time today. Uh, Brian and I are going to talk a little bit about the way that, you know, when, when we ran this work in a district um, and sort of had colleagues from other from other cities doing similar work, the things that we all did to engage and support families in sort of not just the logistics of an application or school choice process, but also like the really hard questions of like, how do you help families understand what schools would actually be right for their students, which is, you know, a much harder question to answer than, you know, here's how you log in to submit your application. And, you know, we're gonna share our thoughts on, on those strategies that districts have done but then I think, you know, most importantly, and the part of this that I'm most excited about is to have Colleen Dipple from Families Empowered here with us today. Um, she'll talk more about Families Empowered and, and that organization if you haven't heard of them, but, you know, they've done the hard work of really supporting families um, as a sort of third party independent, uh, you know, arbiter on questions of sort of choice and, and, and education uh, in Texas for, for years and years and years. And so, we're gonna ask Colleen to then sort of think about those uh, those types of strategies that Brian and I talked through and sort of give us the, you know, the sort of real thoughts from her perspective, uh, given her experience of sort of how families engage with those types of tools and, and where they fall short and where they do sort of really help families uh, meet the mark. And all of this is in the interest of helping all of you as you think about expanding your school choice options and lever three and. Um, and how to better serve families in finding the school that's right for their students, sort of what are strategies that you can use uh, and where are the ones where you get the most sort of bang for your proverbial buck. Um, a moment of housekeeping. Uh, if you're going to chat, that's awesome. Please use the chat in the Zoom window and not the Excel events chat because we can't see that. Uh, and um, I love, I know there's a bunch of names in the room that I don't recognize. And so if people could pop into the chat your name and sort of your role organization, uh, it would really help Brian and Colleen and I sort of know who's in the room. Um, and we'll have time at the end also for, for questions and discussion so we can you know, also get more into that as needed. You can go forward, Chris. Um, so this is just a high level, you know, when we think about the different kinds of parent supports that we can offer, um, we've sort of grouped them into four strategies. Um, some are sort of high touch uh, or maybe even, you know, uh, in some cases, high cost, uh, and others are sort of lower touch, lower cost, um, but all of them or a combination of these strategies can be really be robust when it comes to family engagement. And so we're gonna go a little bit deeper one by one, uh, and then we're gonna pop over to Colleen to talk through these and how they work in practice. Go again, Chris. So in some respects, the sort of, you know, I don't know, gold standard for, you know, for, for helping people is sort of in-person support. Um, for each of these strategies, I highlight a district or two that has done this, uh, done this well. In most cases, I'm, or in all cases, I think I'm using sort of national examples from districts that have had unified enrollment systems in place now for upwards of, you know, uh, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years, and that Brian and I have worked with over our time. So not to say that there isn't good work in these strategies happening in Texas, but we're just sort of pulling out some other, um, some other exemplars. But you know, you know, the sort of high touch and definitely high cost option to support families is in-person support. Um, the way that New Orleans has has sort of put that in action is that you know the city is sort of geographically not huge, but has sort of like three distinct parts of town. And so in each part of town, there is a family resource center staffed with school choice advisors who are there in person to help families who come in. They also do phone and email support. Uh, but they do a lot of in-person support. Um, and you know, as the city has diversified its sort of language access needs, there was a real move to make sure that in every center, there was at least one Spanish speaking school choice advisor because the community needs for Spanish speakers really was, was just growing sort of year over year. Um, and Brian, remind me, Denver also did some in-person support, right? Oh, I can't hear you. Any better um, now? I think, oh yeah, perfect, okay. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, Denver does have two regional engagement centers. They're targeted on different sides of the city uh, in neighborhoods that were identified as higher poverty and uh, needing greater access to that in-person support. We didn't want them to have to come downtown in a city that's further from their home. So really wanted to meet those families where they're at in their community. Yeah, 
Um, and New Orleans had, yeah, that's a sort of similar reason why they opened their in-person centers. And I think, you know, the pros to this approach are not, you know, rocket science. I'm sure everyone here would think about them. But, you know, even in a world where we move so much to online supports, even for all of our daily lives, like, it's really nice sometimes to like have a person to speak to. Uh, and families really appreciate having a person to speak to. And the, you know, when you have centers like this, families really create relationships with the folks who work in those centers um, and sort of can come back as needed for support uh, and feel like they have someone, you know, who they can go to, which is really meaningful. And I think, you know, this in particular helps families with less technological fluency, even if what's happening at those centers is helping the families complete things online, they're getting sort of one-on-one -on -one personal support to do that. I think the challenges of this approach are also fair, you know, fairly obvious. I think they're surmountable, but it requires districts really wanting to, um, I think, lean into some in-person support for families. One of them, of course, is that it just requires an investment. Uh, you have to invest in personnel, which becomes sort of an ongoing cost. You have to sometimes invest in facilities, depending on sort of how your, you know, how your district space works, you know, the number of centers you'd need, whether you can embed yourselves in school buildings or have to search for sort of independent space. Um, I think that can raise, that can certainly impact cost. Uh, I think the two other things are sort of logistical about having support in person, which has a lot of pros, but it's really hard to sort of pivot when, you know, it, we felt this in New Orleans all the time. Like all of a sudden there'd be this burst of activity at one center uh, and sort of lines building up while the other centers were relatively un, you know, unvisited. But you can't just sort of like, you know, <laughs> you can't, you know, sort of like snap your fingers and move staff from one center to another. And so sometimes you end up with a little bit of uneven service because you just can't, you can't quite predict where the, you know, where the crowds are going to be. And, you know, the other thing, and I imagine Colleen will talk about this, is, you know, our centers ran on a work day. You know, they opened at 8.30, they closed at 4. We would dabble in sort of late hours a couple times a week at sort of busy times. But it's not, you know, it's very hard to be really responsive, um, particularly when you're sort of working in a school district, which typically works, you know, nine to five, eight to four, whatever would have you, uh, and have these centers be open at times and families who are who are working during the day can can access them. So that's just another sort of technical challenge. Um, Brian, if anything else to add on this before we keep going? Yeah, one other concern with the flexibility is the time of year. They might be really, really busy in July, August, because families are looking for a school for this coming year. They might be really, really busy in January, February, because they're going through the choice process. So how do you figure out how to ramp up staffing to meet that surge, but then also have the flexibility that those staff can do other functions for the district the other months of the year, or you, you ramp up with seasonal staff? That has some challenges because of some of the intricacies with it. So I think under that umbrella of flexibility, you've got locations within the city, time within the day or week, and then also the months of the year. Yeah, that's a really great point. You can keep going, Chris. Uh, the next sort of set of supports are also sort of high touch because they allow for really sort of targeted, personalized response to families and can also be, you know, maybe not as high cost as, as hiring more personnel, but would still require personnel and still require some investment. Um, and this comes down to, you know, how are you going to support families via email, phone, and chat? Uh, because some families are fine not coming in in person. And if they can actually talk to an individual, even if it's over phone or virtually, that can be really meaningful. And we have examples of districts that have really invested in this type of sort of like high touch virtual support. Uh, my school, DC, has a, they've had a telephone hotline since they started that sort of runs longer hours. They, they've contracted out their telephone hotline. Um, but they do a lot of work to make sure that hotline has the information they need to serve families. Uh, One Camden also does a lot of text support um, as well as email and, and a hotline. I think there are some real pros to this approach, you know, to the point that Brian and I were talking about a moment ago, which is when you're in sort of disparate locations, you can't necessarily respond to where the, the most traffic is. With these kinds of virtual supports, you actually could keep your staff centralized um, and sort of always have the, the, the most amount of your staff available to support families uh, in one place, even if, even if volume gets high on phone, email, uh, and, and chat. Um, 
they still receive sort of personalized support from experts, depending on how you set this up. There could be a way where families could, you know, if they if they really know Brian and he's helped them before, where they can sort of even through these virtual supports sort of come back in and get help from Brian in the future. Um, and it also, you know, what, what we, what, you know, all of you probably know as you work and support families is often families have similar questions um, and you can sort of really streamline responses to sort of like level one questions and make those really easy to respond to and sort of automate some of those responses so that you have more time for folks who have sort of higher level questions that require, you know, more personal support. And so, you know, depending on the type of you know, the type of system you use, um, you can really make the sort of like customer service management and relationship management really, really sort of automated and streamlined, which can be good. Um, but I think some of the challenges to both of these high touch options remain the same, which is you still need personnel to actually do this support. You can't skimp on it. Um, you know, one of our biggest challenges uh, that we faced in New Orleans and that I know that my co you know colleagues in other districts have faced is, you know, when you're doing in-person support to families, you're, you can't also be answering emails and answering the telephone. So how do you manage in-person support and email and chat and telephone support? How do you think about what staff is doing what and how you're not sort of, um, you know, overburdening single staff members with sort of all modes of communication. And so it still is relatively staff intensive to do even these kinds of virtual supports. We still have to think about the flexibility of hours. Um, you know, and, and weekends and stuff, you still have some of those same challenges, particularly when school districts tend to be sort of, you know, eight to four types of organizations. Um, and, you know, there are some families, and I think a lot about, you know, in particular, sort of like the grandparents who are raising their grandchildren, you know, who, who, who just want in person, um, and maybe even with really robust virtual supports will feel like, will feel like they want to be speaking to someone um, about what they need and, and might might not really love a sort of chat chat function or or phone support. Brian, anything you would add here? Now, there's one potential benefit you get here from like a hybrid approach is uh, when we talk about support after hours. Now that folks are used to working from home, can you stagger your staff, or even if they don't have to physically be at the office late because of you know any concerns about that? Can they, you know, do some of the virtual support from home now that those kind of work from home lines have been blurred over the past year? So that is one potential advantage to think about. Can you can you increase the hours that you uh, are available to families, even if it's not in person? And can you do virtually? So there could be a little bit of a hybrid between the previous slide and this slide. Yeah, it's true. Some people would love to start work at ten, for example, even if it means they're staying on, you know, till six or seven. Yeah. Next slide. And then I think, you know, the, the districts that do this best really combine these sort of like low touch, um, you know, lower, lower cost supports with the sort of high touch supports. And so obviously, you know, online supports, particularly in this day and age, are, can be really, really meaningful. And a well-designed website that's clear and sort of you know, helps families come in at the ground floor and then sort of work their way deeper into the information they know. Things that have uh, FAQs, you know, potentially animations. So if a family is not uh, as literate, perhaps, or has, you know, str struggle sort of like reading a whole page of text, but animations that break down how processes work can be really helpful. Um, interactive school chooser websites. I know a lot of our SGS districts have done some work to build school choosers. Uh, can help, all these things can help families. I think here we have some good examples of places that have, that I think highlight things that are really important. You know, Indianapolis, uh, if you go to the Enroll Indy website, it's a nice example of a school finder that lets families sort of actively filter and search for schools that meet the, meet the things they want. I know obviously Midland is also recently launched one of those, I think a couple of years ago. And, um, you know, there's a bunch of SGS districts who have school school finders and school choosers out there that, that sort of call on the same best practices. Um, I think something nice about Denver's website is it sort of very clearly differentiates, it helps families who sort of end up on that website, like do they want to enroll right now? Is that their challenge? Or are they looking to enroll for the year to come? So it doesn't just focus on the lottery for the following year, but also helps families who need to make a change right now and sort of differentiates them. That's a really important point. It can be easy, I think, to create sort of a slick website that's all about the lottery. 
that sort of you drive families to that website. But for a lot of families, they might need to enroll immediately. Maybe they have to transfer because there's some issue with the school they're in. Maybe they just moved in from out of, out of district. Maybe they don't know what their zone school is. And so how do you create a website that sort of lets families figure out what path they need to go down from a very sort of simplified beginning? Um, and then I think, you know, I, I do think animations can be really helpful. I think both my school DC and the Enroll NOLA team in New Orleans, you know, they have animations that describe how the lottery works. Um, that question of sort of lottery mechanics or how the algorithm works can get sort of larger than life in districts that have done single best offer lotteries. And people can be confused about what that means. Like, you know, how actually is my child being selected for schools? And animations provide a really nice way to, to, to make that the logic of those lotteries more approachable. Um, and those are some, some really nice, nice examples. I would say, you know, the biggest challenge here um, and, it, you know, and my thought and Brian obviously want to hear your thoughts and Colleen, we'll get to you in a moment because I'm sure you have thoughts too, is a confusing website can do more harm than good. Uh, you know, often the website is the first place families will come. You know, if they're just moved to a town and they want to know how to enroll, if they, you know, they'll pop onto the school district website. And if that initial experience doesn't feel um, organized, uh, sort of understandable, it can really sort of just sow so much confusion. Uh, and and, and uh, I think it's really hard, you know, website design is no joke. There's a reason why people do it for a living. Um, and so thinking really thoughtfully about your website, even as it is now, um, <clears throat> and if you, you know, have the opportunity to create a new one, I think doing a lot of looking at good examples and, and Brian and I can share ones and Colleen, obviously, if she has examples of good ones can share them. Uh, and then thinking about how to, how to sort of replicate those best practices on your own is really, really meaningful. Brian? Yeah, it, it can feel tactical, but I, I think understanding how a family accesses your district website as a whole and being mindful of buzzwords, enrollment and school choice might make a lot of sense to the folks on this call, but to a family of a four-year-old, that might not be the term that they would have thought of. So. Uh, trying to understand uh, and, and speak it in the parents' voice, especially of those younger families, that this is very new to them in the district. I think that's one. And I think another is understanding the links within your district website. Uh, sometimes, you know, you might start to contradict yourself where you're, you're headed down one path as a family and then, you know, you would expect them to kind of make a left turn to another district's page. Um, so really trying to keep them at the center of the experience knowing that this is probably one of the times that the district, that families access like the district as opposed to their school. Very often families are interacting with their school more than anything else. This is, this is kind of the welcome mat to the district, right? This is their first interaction. And so really making sure to put it in their voice. And that probably means going out and talking to families. And that's what I'm really excited for Colleen to share in a few minutes, which is how to get their authentic voice and design the experience for them. And not just design it around what you as a district leader thinks that it should be, because this is for your parents. Yep. Next slide, Chris. And then finally, this is, you know, I don't know, I, I think maybe New Orleans is the best, the best example of this that I've come across. I'd be really curious to hear if anyone here knows of others or feel like your district has done this well. But the truth is, you know, no matter how small your district, it is nearly impossible to talk to every parent. There's, it's just not something that's feasible to be done. Um, and so I think thinking a lot about how do you increase your reach, uh, a, a sort of low touch way to do that in terms of cost, although it does require investment, um, is a sort of train the trainer method, right? So, you know, in New Orleans, we had two really strong partners in, out in the sort of ecosystem of, you know, advocacy for better schools and, and working with families. One of them was Ed Navigator, which is sort of a similar organization to Families Empowered, but does not, I don't think they're in Texas at all. Um, and the other is the Urban League of Louisiana. And we did a fair amount to make sure that the people on the staff of both of those organizations who were working with families around questions of school choice or enrollment deeply understood how our systems worked so that they sort of could have just increase the reach. They would, they would talk to families that we might never speak to. But it requires, I think, you know, two things that are hard, that can be hard to come by. One of them is just trust. You know, you have to have an organization out there that you actually believe 
we'll be a good partner in this. We'll give you, you know, we'll sort of, you know, deliver unbiased information uh, and that you can sort of trust to deliver the messaging you're providing them. And also they have to trust you. It has to go both ways, right? So they have to trust that you as the district um, are really trying to help families and are trying to, you know, create practices and policies and procedures that are in their best interest that they then feel comfortable sort of you know, becoming in some respects, almost like a spokesperson for your processes. If they don't trust you as a district, it's unclear why they would do that. So trust has to run both ways. And then the other, and this is sort of, you know, this becomes really tactical, but, you know, for those of you who are running some sort of enrollment systems or choice systems already, um, the work is really busy and really chaotic. And when you have these relationships with other organizations, you have to remember when like something happens that you weren't expecting or something gets delayed or there's a change to a rule or procedure, you have to remember to tell them so that they know that that change and are telling the right things to families. So the, that, you, you know, that partnership needs to remain sort of front of mind at all times to make sure that they're always giving the right information. I think one done well, it can be really powerful. Um, we certainly, you know, in my experience, you know, Ed Navigator and Urban League were tough on us. If they felt we were doing things that weren't right or weren't family forward, like they let us know. And I think, you know, I think it made us better, but you have to be willing to sort of engage in that trusting relationship, take critical feedback, you know, early and often, um, and sort of constantly strive to make sure that they're in the loop so that they can help families um, that you haven't yet had a chance to speak to. Brian, any thoughts on this one? Yeah, I, I think there's not a ton of examples in this, but I think it's a good thought exercise for your district to say, who are those partners in your community that are trusted by families that you think could be a, a, an honest partner uh, for engaging them? And then what does it look like to open up those conversations and start to talk about how they can be you know, that extension of your team at those busiest moments of the year? Yeah, thanks. And at the end of the day, you know, we, you know, Brian and I have done sessions and, and we've done all this, you know, and with your EAs and, you know, on sort of like how to operationalize lever three, right? What is, what does it mean to bring a tech vendor on board and what are the rules around unified enrollment systems? You know, all of that, you can have the most perfect system in the world, but if you, you know, if you can't engage families on sort of why it exists, what it's doing, how it's there for them, it doesn't matter how great that system is. Ultimately, the work of engaging families is the sort of, you know, it's everything that we're doing with SGS, right? We're trying to create schools that, that families want for their students. Um, and so, you know, I would encourage, you know, the sort of district system leaders on this call here to really think about the investments in parent engagement um, as something that's a little bit non-negotiable when it comes when it comes to this work. And I think often, you know, we often parents, although they are our really sort of like main stakeholder when we're working in districts, right, students and parents, it can be very easy um, to sort of give shorter shrift than I think we would all care to admit uh, on, on actual parent engagement and listening to parents. And on that end, next slide, please, Chris. We are going to get to go have a little bit of a conversation with Colleen Dipple. Um, so you can see some questions here that we're going to ask her. Uh, once we get through these, we'll have a little bit of time for discussion and Q&A if anyone in the audience wants to sort of jump in and, and, and ask anything. But let's just start. Colleen, please introduce yourself, introduce Families Empowered and what the, and the work you've done in Texas. Great. Um, thanks. And thank you all for um, joining today. I see there are 59 people on this and, and it's one o'clock in the afternoon and a very hot day. And um, so I appreciate being included. Um, so Families Empowered is a, uh, we're a family service organization. Uh, we connect families to schools and schools to families. So we do that almost everything on the support strategy page. I've been taking notes like crazy, this is super interesting. Um, so we provide parents with um, information, tools, um, services, direct services and support um, as they look for a school that works for them. So we partner with districts. Um, some districts, uh, I see people on here um, who I've known for a little while. Um, we partner with public charter schools. We, public, we partner with private schools. We provide parents with free bilingual service um, as they're looking for schools. And we don't take a position on the school that they ought to go to. We just give them information and we provide opportunities for them to connect with those school representatives or leaders. Um, so we interface a lot with all, I'm about to say something very Texan, all y'all systems. <laughs> 
So we are sending folks to district websites and then we get the callbacks about those sites to the point about like that maybe aren't so helpful. Um, we also build relationships with folks in districts who are us who are really sort of assigned to do this work um, and, and likewise charters. Some of you may know us. I think when we first started this work, we were called kind of I think we got branded as sort of the charter school waitlist people. Uh, we are not the charter school waitlist people. We do partner with charter schools, but we are a parent service organization. We're serving families in Houston metro area. Um, we have about 60,000 families in our database who we're interacting with pretty regularly who live in the Houston metro area um, in Bear County. So not just in Antonio ISD. I think I saw Edgewood on here. We've worked with Edgewood folks. Um, and then Central Texas, so that's not just Austin, which we're doing a cool project with Austin ISD right now, but um, I think I've seen people from like Maynard and other places. Um, and then we're most, now we're moving into Tarrant County, so Fort Worth, we're pretty excited about that. So that's high level. Um, one other thing we do that's not necessarily a school connection uh, work, that's not direct service to parents, um, is that we do do some data insights. So we do a lot of um, listening. We actually um, do micro surveys and have been, we every other month kind of launch a survey to ask parents actually what matters to them. Sometimes it's about our own service. Like, do you, do you like our emails <laughs> or should we should we extend our phone service we have a call center should we so we actually ask for parent feedback so i think you maybe said like not fail forward fail fast but fail fail fast and, and pivot we care a lot about what parents need and how they want to get information and support so um, and we share that information often with community partners uh, school partners other folks that's awesome, Colleen. I mean, so thinking about just what you've learned about the way families engage with these supports, the way you are, you and your staff have engaged with some of these districts, like, you know, when you think about the strategy, strategies we just went through, are there ones that you think feel more critical than others? Um, and, you know, that's combined question two and three, like what things seem to resonate most with families versus what things just fall flat? Yeah, so I mean, so we're having real, we have a lot of um, engagement with families. And I got asked today uh, by someone, they said, why do you think so many families, for example, we have very high response rates when we send out surveys. This person, said, why do you think that is? And I said, well, um, I actually think for us, it's because we really have spent resources um, in the last really four years um, on that high touch side, right? So we didn't for a long time because it felt like, it was really costly. Uh, Brian made some points about like, when do we hire these people and how do we, we have a full-time call center, right? And, you know, eight to five isn't really convenient. So how do we, we were sort of just hiring part-time people or college kids. And I think that, that for us, the moment we doubled down and said, we are going to hire real full-time people. We're going to salary them. We're going to give them benefits and we're going to actually have them because we have three of them, we can stagger the time um, and we're gonna really give them the support and the training they need um, and they're bilingual uh, to be able to respond to parents. That high touch created a lot of, I think multiple tr times trust was, was raised here. Um, that trust is sort of the anchor for everything, whether it's trust with an organization or trust with a district or trust with an NGO like ours. Um, and really this is a people business. People trust people, not institutions. Um, so you have to have, I feel like one of that, those questions, um, what are more important? I don't know that any one of these is more important. Like for some families, a website's all they need, right? For some families, a website gives them information that leads them somewhere where they can get a clarifying question answered. Um, but if there's a breakdown at any one point, um, you know, it, it, it can be really tough because it's really about trust and it's a, a connection. So, um, but I would say the high touch and online sports. And the last thing I'd also add is virtual um, is interesting. So we, before the pandemic, used texting and emailing and robocalling and all these sort of digital strategies. Um, those were more like reminders, like reminder, the HISD magnet school applications open or reminder, you know, this charter lottery started today and people can click on them and, and it's very efficient and effective. Um, but during the pandemic, we started doing virtual events 
Um, and some of the districts here have partnered and participated in those. That's an interesting hybrid strategy where you can create almost a high touch um, sort of opportunity that can live somewhere virtually and that you can send to other people. So I think that maybe one upside to this very depressing year and stressful year for everybody here is that maybe some of this technology can be used to build better relationships with families um, and restore some trust and, and really help inform parents about all the really creative, innovative work that, that these districts are doing. Thanks for that, Colleen. I think our final question is, you know, just what, what advice do you have to the folks here today who are thinking about ways um, you know, to, to sort of increase information and access to schools, to serve, you know, to sort of serve and engage families better. What would you tell them to do? Yeah, so I think you guys already said it. And again, I would say anchoring this on the trust issue, um, you know, th that I would really make sure, I think folks that are doing this well, that we're working with, they have dedicated resources to having one, if not a team, but at least one person who literally every day, this is there, whether it's like director of community engagement, community, you know, whatever you call it, but someone who every day wakes up and thinks about, are we treating parents uh, like customers? Meaning like, have we asked their opinion? Have we got, do we have their feedback? Are we engaging with them on their level and in a way that works for them? Um, and what is, how do we know that? And having, putting some resources, if ever there was a time to direct resources to that, that would be my like sort of biggest piece of advice is it's always stressful for us when a parent calls and, and needs our help and they're super high stress, they're stressed about something that's going on. And they're like, I've called five people, I, I don't know where to go or what to do. And it's really hard, the schools where we know we like, we know we can call this person and they'll figure it out. Like there is someone who is literally on point on this and wakes up every day thinking, how are we engaging with the community? Um, what does that look like in practice? How do we measure our, our impact? How are we actually, how do we know we're doing a good job, um, both quantitatively and qualitatively? Um, that would be my biggest piece of advice is it's, it is money well spent. <laughs> Uh, to, to, and I know everybody's tight on dollars all the time, um, but when parents leave because they feel dissatisfied or there's broken trust or they don't feel they're being listened to or heard or they can't get what they need, you know, all those dollars leave with them too. So I, I think it's important to think about that investment. That's it. That's all I'd say. I mean, I have a lot more to say, but, but yes, for one thing, that was it. <laughs> I like it. I like it. And I, I, I appreciate you you saying that. I, mean, I think it's true, you know, like families leaving is what we don't want. Um, and so how do you make sure that they feel supported and they stay? We have, you know, we're sort of stopping here so we can keep some time for questions or discussion. You know, Alicia um, from Ector County put a great, you know, sort of was like, we do this all ourselves. You know, who else can we work with on this work? Um, you know, I think Brian offered, you know, I think the, I do think the public library could be a system that you could, you know, that has invested in also supporting families that could be a partner in this work. Um, I think thinking about, you know, are there nonprofits in your, in your area, you know, whether it's like the YMCA or, um, you know, like an urban league type of organization you could partner with, a families in power type of organization you could partner with. Um, and sometimes that means giving, you know, it's actually, you know, you're not just, they're not just doing you a favor, you're actually entering into a partnership with them that might might mean some dollars passing. Um, but I think that can be really, really worthwhile. Also other social service agencies, um, you know, families who need to interact with, um, you know, uh, in Louisiana, we did a lot of work with the sort of nurse partnerships who worked with our youngest families who required sort of early intervention to make sure they knew about getting into sort of free early childcare. Um, so I think that's, that's, those are folks to tap. Um, Colleen's putting other ideas in the chat, but please, if any other folks have questions or thoughts they want to share for Colleen or Brian or myself um, or anyone else in the audience, please uh, please feel free to jump in. Can I can I add one thing yeah. that we're doing? It's super interesting. So we're actually working on two projects 
right now, one with um, Austin ISD and one with Houston ISD, and they're focused on enrollment, right? And so, Gabby, you're part of the Houston ISD work, and mm -hmm. we, we're we really interested in asking parents, like, how they engage in the processes that are being set up at the district, um, and, and we we're really excited about that, right? So the way that we think about then that data collection is, you know, that's not data necessarily that we're, we're you like we we're interested in it, but that data is then owned by the district that wants to use it to improve their processes and to be more, um, and there are lots of balancing acts too, right? Like they've got to balance parents, they've got to balance staff and central office and resource constraints. Um, but, you know, we've found over, 10 years of this work that there are ways to you know for districts to work with non-for-profits that can actually both support the technical side of it but also some like it, data insights because sometimes parents are very afraid to share information with the school directly they just are right they're afraid that they're going to get something will not happen for their kids it's usually wrong but that's a, that's a worry and a fear and so um often we'll have parents tell us things that they may not tell the district and when we engage in those partnerships um we did that with saisd about seven years ago we essentially are like look this is your data this is your information we're not going to use it to sort of shame you or put information if, if we learn something that's tough to hear um we're not going to put that in the newspaper or, or put it out on our website um, but I find it always really humbling and inspiring when districts are like, we want to hear it. Like we have to lift up the mirror and get that feedback. So anyone who's interested in learning more about that, you know, we're happy to share info. That's awesome. Thanks, Colleen. And there was just a great, a great question in the chat or ask for advice, which is, you know, how do you reach the families who are just not engaged? Um, that's the hardest piece of work here. And, you know, Colleen, I'll, I'll sort of kick it to you and Brian as well. You know, I think this is where, you know, what I sort of found in my experience doing this is that if you ask families to come to you, you get the families who already know they should come to you. But you don't get the families who don't know that or the families who aren't able to come to you for whatever reason, right? They're working multiple jobs, you know, whatever their, whatever reason their lives are chaotic or whatnot. And so this is where I think thinking about those organizations that families already engage with, um, whether they be social service agencies or you know, all of these sort of like boys and girls clubs, these ideas sort of listed here can really help because you know, there are places families do have to go. If you think about where they're already going, maybe it's sort of like churches. If you have a, if you have a big church, you know, the churches in your community where families go, um, you know, how do you how do you push information out through those organizations so that you're not sort of burdening families with having to go somewhere else? Um, but Colleen, Brian, any other thoughts on that? I, I can start on the data side, because um, one of the things that could be helpful is if you have a district with 30,000 students, you might think, my gosh, how could we possibly engage 30,000 students if we only have a few uh, full-time staff working on this. But I think what could be really helpful is what are the families that are uh, m uh, the highest priority for you in this? So it might be those pre-K families who are selecting from a kindergarten program, or it might be eighth grade families that are picking a high school, right? So we, we can be less concerned about the third graders going to fourth grade since their current school already has fourth grade, right? Let's really try to prioritize those families. And if there's other prioritization kind of filters you can do to say, well, maybe we want our pre-K students that uh, are in a Head Start program, our pre-K students who are at risk. How can we take 30,000 students in our district and maybe focus on 1,000 families that we think could have the highest upside coming from this type of outreach? Um, I know in Denver, we did that kind of micro targeting in a way to say, these are the neighborhoods we're most interested in, these are the grade levels we're most interested in, and not in native English speaking families we're most interested in. We took 92,000 students and we got it down to a few thousand. That's a lot more manageable for your staff than the big number. So I think part of it can be a prioritization on your behalf um, to figure out the families that you're most interested in reaching out to. And then your resources from like a ratio perspective can go a lot further than if you were to look at the whole district. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I think Brian is spot on. I think the districts that are doing this well, like think about like an SAISD and like they're just data animals, right? So you just, the data investment is really hard, um, you know, because it's unseen and it's really painful, but it's the most important thing you can do. I mean, everyone's always like, oh, how did you get, we have over a hundred thousand families in our data. We can slice and dice and shape file and pull out and really target in a, and we have very limited resources, um, but targeting, targeting your communication and even how you communicate. So it might be, you know, some, Families respond to text. Some are on Insta, whatever, Insta, you know, social media, whatever it is. But you're thinking about different ways. Really, I'm serious. Like parents, I mean, I was like, do we need to have a TikTok? I guess it's a channel. Uh, but but younger younger parents, right, who are in their 20s, uh, where are they? Meeting them where they are. Um, we don't send anything out in just English. Everything's in English and Spanish. Um, but I think that that data piece, you're right, is so important because what you can do is you can also learn a lot about your families if your data infrastructure is sophisticated. So that's another place where if I had resources, if I had like ESSA money or a new, big new pot of money to, to make investments, I might be investing in data, which doesn't feel sexy and it's not outward, but it is so valuable. Yeah, yeah, all great points. Yeah, I think you, yeah, that's right. You have time for one more question or comment, either in the chat or verbally, and then we are, you know, we're just about finished up. I know the micro targeting makes me think about, you know, what elections do, right? They do so much sort of like <laughs> slicing and dicing of voter register lists, and to really sort of get at get at populations that they that they want to. Um, sort of move. And in some ways, participating in school choice is a campaign, right? You're first, you're sort of informing and then you're sort of driving families to action. So I think, you know, you actually can sort of learn a lot from the way campaigns campaigns work. You, you can also build relationships with people you don't have relationships with. So, right, if you're using like a, a mail, a, like a pardot, and you can start to get data insights from your mail, you say, who's opened it? Who's clicked through? So my conversation with that person is, hey, I saw you open this email or you started this application. Do you need any help? For somebody else, it's like these these 50 people haven't even opened their email. So we maybe need to have a high touch call for them or we need to do a community event with a trusted organization in that community. Like you can actually use the limited resources you have. It's a strategic long-term play better when you have that kind of information. So yes, it is like a campaign and it's micro-targeting, but it will help. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think to sort of like revisit, you know, what you said in the beginning, Colleen, like it requires investment. It requires money and personnel. It has to be something as a district um, that you that you feel is important enough that you're going to sort of put that money and personnel behind because this is real work. It doesn't just families don't just find out because you put up a website and you walk away. Um, and I think it can be very easy to uh, to think the sort of school finder is the last thing you have to do. There's a website now. Families can get the information they need and sort of think you're done and you're really not done yet. And so I do hope you know I hope this conversation and these strategies that we've put up have. Uh, both made you feel excited about the possibilities, maybe a little nervous about how hard it is, but you already know how hard it is. And so hopefully it just makes you feel like there are options out there that you can you can continue to, to sort of call on and learn from. And you know, um, you know, we're we're happy to to talk about any of this with any of you at any point because we think this work is really important. So thank you so so much uh, for coming out today. And um, yes, there is a virtual lounge after this where Brian and I will be hanging out. Uh, with a virtual, what did we get this morning, Chris? A virtual pastry. Uh, <laughs> cool. so. Okay, a virtual pastry, all, all, anything you can imagine. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, I'll click on over. No, we'll be we'll be thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks, Brian, Gabby, and thank you, Colleen, for sharing. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Colleen. Appreciate it.